Hello everyone, I'm Gillian Dow and it's my pleasure to uh, do this week three roundup. I am here at the University of Southampton, I am in my office on Avenue campus and I'm going to go through some of the things that you've been discussing on the message boards this week. I always really enjoy seeing what people are making of the material we put together and um, I always really enjoy interacting with you as well as you as you work your way through that material. So we had um, three broad areas for you to think about this week. Translations, adaptations, by which we meant film and, and television adaptations, and then finally telling Jane Austen's story or the museums and the cultural organisations that work with her life and work with her work and thinking about how we might curate that material to tell a story about Jane Austen that might appeal to um, participants uh, in participants today. So to start with translations then, this is a research area of mine and I always really like to see people um, encountering Isabelle de Montaulieu for the first time and being very shocked by what she did with her translation of Sense and Sensibility in particular. So I, I, hope, I know for some of you that that was very new, um, others of you have no doubt come across her before. Isabelle de Montaulieu was, as I say in that section of the course this week, a global brand, or at least a Western European brand. Her name sells books. In fact, there's a copy of one of her translations of a German woman writer in the library at Godmersham Park that you encountered on this course back in week one um, via its digitised version. Um, so it's just possible that Jane Austen would have picked up that novel in the library at Godmersham Park and that she knew of its existence and of Isabelle de Montaulieu as a translator. She certainly knew of Isabelle de Montaulieu as an author, um, as the author of Caroline de Litchfield, Caroline of Litchfield, which was a bestseller across Europe, translated into English um, and indeed other European languages. So this question of, of branding and who was the most um, uh, popular writer in the period is one that um, I'm interested in too. Um, when you think about how Jane Austen's father tried to sell um, her novels to start with, he said it was very much like um, Francis Burney's um, Evelina, about the length of Francis Burney's Evelina. So he was drawing the publisher's attention to the fact that Jane Austen could be compared to the much more famous and popular writer Francis Burney. But of course, Austen was branded from the start by her publishers. And this question of how an unknown author was to go about selling their works is something publishers themselves really engaged with. So Austen published anonymously. Yes, absolutely. Most authors in her period published anonymously, in fact, including Walter Scott, her much more famous contemporary. But she didn't just publish anonymously. She published as by a lady. And that is its own branding, isn't it? You know, this is a, 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 a an indicator that the author is female, perhaps um, a sense that women readers in particular would appreciate her work. This was a decision made by Edgerton when he published Sense and Sensibility that it would be best published as a work by a lady. Then from then on, she was published as by the author of Sense and Sensibility, by the author of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, and so on and so on. So this question of branding might feel very new, but in fact, it's been there since the beginning. And it's really interesting to see now how Jane Austen is branded to different readers via translations in different countries. This question of, you know, what kind of image is the most uh, appropriate to market her works for, for a variety of readers is something that publishers really grapple with. It can be really interesting to, to look at variant translations of novels. So I've done some work on this myself in relation to French translations. There are five rival translations of Pride and Prejudice that are av available to the French reader at the moment, and they all brand themselves very slightly differently. Um, there might be a 
a preface by a contemporary French woman writer. There might be um, a painting um, that we that we would recognise as by uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So what does it mean to have Jane Austen's um, Regency period heroines looking like the um, pre-Raphaelites? Um, so all, all of these questions of how publishers go about attracting new readers to Austen's work can be very fruitfully explored by looking at that paratextual presentation. So I hope you'll continue to um, comment on that section of the course and give us information about um, how Austen is branded in your country. How is she sold to readers in your country? Are comparisons made with canonical authors where you live? Um, this is a, a really good step for our international participants in particular. The next section of the course got you thinking about adaptations, about films, about TV adaptations, about perhaps plays, about the question of um, how Austen has made that move from book to screen. And of course, that's been happening for a very long time. Um, it's been happening um, on, on the stage since the um, early 20th century, indeed. And here I'm going to give a shout out to a really um, interesting book and well worth your time, Devney Lozer's The Making of Jane Austen. That's Devney Lozer, L O. O-O-S-E-R, The Making of Jane Austen, which really looks at, well, how, how the author's reputation is, um, is made through the 19th and right up into the 21st century. We got you thinking in that section about um, radical heroines and about Mansfield Park in particular as a radical novel. There's been some really interesting comments about Fanny Price herself as a radical heroine throughout the course. You know, Alison last week in her roundup talked about um, Fanny Price as being someone who's static and the events of the novel happen around her and the extent to which the themes of Mansfield Park are radical. Of course, um, slavery is on the outskirts of that novel. It's where the Bertram family's money is coming from. So although there's a dead silence along around the discussion of it, it's very much present in the in the text and in the remaking of that um, uh, novel too, when you think about adaptations like Patricia Rosima's um, Mansfield Park, which is very much um, influenced by those post-colonial criticisms of Mansfield Park. Um, so uh, critics, critics like Rosima's adaptation because it engages very fully with the academic and critical discourse of the mid-1990s when Jane Austen as a radical writer was being, I think, perhaps discovered for the, for the first time. So what um, that adaptation of Mansfield Park does is it recreates Fanny Price herself as a character who is a writer. She is a heroine who's very much inspired by what people know of Jane Austen herself. Very much inspired, that is, by the new edition of her letters that came out in the 1990s, edited by Deirdre Le Fay. And I think that that sort of snarky heroine, the snarky Austen that we see in her letters has very much affected Austen's own heroines. Really good example of that is the new persuasion that came out on Netflix last year with Dakota Johnson in the title, in the role of Anne Elliot, um, the heroine of persuasion. Now, Anne Elliot is a heroine who's very unlike perhaps Elizabeth Bennet and very unlike perhaps Jane Austen herself, but that adaptation from last year uses some of the lines from Austen's own letters and puts them in Anne Elliot's mouth. So there's a, there was a Guardian review, I remember, of um, that adaptation, which says it was um, Jane Austen meets Fleabag, the uh, adaptation where you've got um, the character speaking direct to camera. And certainly there's an element of that, um, I think, a fleabagization, we might have it, of Jane Austen herself. But what's interesting to me as a, as a scholar and one who looks at Austen's biographical portraits in her, in her novels is that it's, what we're meeting is Jane Austen herself via her character of Anne Elliot. So might be interesting even for those of you who think that you might hate that adaptation just to look watch it with that in mind 
Also in the comments this week, there's an interesting question about what radical might actually mean. What is it to be radical in this period? And I think that's something that um, that's worth spending a bit of time on, actually. You know, what do we mean when we say that something is radical? Um, is it the plot? Is it the subject matter? Or could it be something else? So think about Mansfield Park, published in 1814, and then think about Jane Austen's very next novel, um, Emma. She says of Emma that she's going to create a heroine who no one but myself will much like. So she recognised that Emma was a difficult heroine, Emma was a challenging heroine, Emma was a heroine that no one but she would much admire and like. Is the subject matter of the novel of Emma radical? Um, on the surface, no. There is a mention of slavery. Jane um, Fairfax um, compares the governess trade um, to the to the slave trade, so it's sort of on the on the outskirts. But it is the one of Austen's novels that can be described as three or four families in a country village. So that was what Jane Austen famously wrote to her niece that she should concentrate on three or four families in a country village when she was writing her own novel. That was her niece. Anna Austen, who had novelistic pretensions. So Emma focuses on three or four families in a country village, but where it is radical is in terms of form. And it can be really interesting to think back then to some of the reviews and the anecdotal accounts you were looking at in week one on this course, when you looked up reviews of Austen's novels. And I hope managed to have a look at Walter Scott's review of Emma, where he clearly was recognising Jane Austen's genius, but not quite sure how she was doing it. Mariah Edgeworth was the same. She said, nothing happens in this novel. It's an old man eating gruel, nothing much happens. There's no sense that Mariah Edgeworth actually got past the first volume of Emma, but if she had, she would have seen it, I think, as a radical novel in terms of form and in terms of style. Jane Austen's use of free and direct discourse is really coming into its own in, in this, her fourth novel. And when you think about the novel in terms of the heroine itself, Emma Woodhouse is not a million miles away from Anne Elliot. She doesn't sit while things happen around her, but she's certainly from the narrative perspective at the centre of the story, while other characters are having a very rich life around her, about which we know very little. So Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax are a really good example of what I'm talking about here. We know by the end of the novel, that they have been conducting an illicit affair throughout. There's a secret engagement. Frank sends Jane Fairfax a piano. There's a moment in the novel where they're perhaps interrupted in a moment of an embrace, um, which can be a really nice way of thinking about um, that relationship that's being carried on. We don't get to see it because what we're seeing is what Emma Woodhouse is seeing. So this is new. This is a new direction for the realist novel to be taking at the beginning of the 19th century. So from that point of view, it's just as radical as Mansfield Park, but it's radical in very different ways. And finally, we got you to think about um, how we tell Austen's story, how we might curate exhibitions, how we might be inspired by Jane Austen herself, um, and how we might be inspired by her as a writer, how we might use some of her techniques to create our own fictions and imaginings. And I hope you enjoyed meeting my colleague, um, Rebecca Smith, herself a collateral descendant from the, of the Austen family, who herself writes um, wonderful fiction um, and and has 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 published um, about being inspired by her time in the Austin House Museum too. So there's there's plenty I hope for you to keep thinking about, keep commenting on. Um, mostly what Alison and Kim and I hope and anyone who's been involved in this course actually from my um, colleague in the history department John MacLear who you met last week talking to you about Jane Austen and the Navy to my colleague Stephen Bending who's currently on research leave writing a book about transatlantic gardens that will be out um, we hope 
sometime next year. We've all enjoyed putting this material together for you and we hope that what it has done has made you want to read more Jane Austen and read more of her contemporaries perhaps. I've already recommended on the message boards that if you like Austen, do try Mariah Edgeworth, do try Frances Burney. Try also Susan Ferrier, whose marriage is published in 1818 and can be very fruitfully compared to Austen's own work. I like her very much. Um, also, the novelist Charlotte Smith, publishing um, in the 1790s and almost certainly an inspiration for Jane Austen herself. There are a load of wonderful women writers um, who are publishing at the same time as Jane Austen and whose work is very much worth your time. So do Go seek those works out, enjoy them. If it's a bit of Anne Radcliffe under the covers by torchlight, then that will be time well spent too. And for those of you who are um, keen to follow this up further, um, we're always happy to meet um, enthusiasts of any kind of literature here at the University of Southampton. So perhaps our paths will cross here at some point in the future. But in the meantime, I wish you all the very best and keep reading Jane Austen and keep reading her contemporaries. <laughs>